In this video, we're going to look at radiation from real surfaces. We're going to define some important surface properties relevant to radiation, including the reflectivity, the absorptivity, the transmissivity, and the emissivity. We'll also look at an energy, the surface energy balances. And finally, we'll look at some radiation in enclosures in order to come up with some very important relations uh, to relate the absorptivity and the emissivity. First, we're going to talk about the irradiation of a surface. The irradiation is the radiation that is incident upon a surface. And that irradiation is coming from some other surface elsewhere, which is at the temperature that we often talk about as T surroundings. And therefore, the spectral nature of the radiation that is incident upon the surface will have the spectral characteristics of radiation coming from the T surroundings. And one such example is we often idealize the radiation coming from the sun, at least to the outer edge of the atmosphere, uh, is uh, that of a black body at about a temperature of 5800 Kelvin. Now once that irradiation is incident upon a surface, a number of different things can happen to it. The first is some fraction of it can be reflected from that surface. Reflectivity is a surface property that tells us the fraction of radiation that is of that incident irradiation that is reflected by that surface. We can look at a number of different properties of decreasing complexity, and the first is the spectral directional reflectivity. And the spectral directional reflectivity is a function of the wavelength and the uh, direction, and that is that fraction of the irradiation at a given direction and wavelength that is reflected relative to the total at that direction and wavelength. If we can integrate that over the entire hemisphere, or if it is a diffuse surface, then we can talk about the spectral hemispherical reflectivity, which is now that portion of the irradiation which is reflected at a given wavelength relative to the total uh, irradiation at that wavelength. And finally, if we consider all wavelengths, we can look at the re reflectivity as the fraction of the incident irradiation that is reflected. So if we look at the spectral hemispherical reflectivity, of course, we can calculate that by multiplying this uh, reflectivity as a function of direction times uh, the radiation intensity at any wavelength and direction, and integrating that over the hemisphere relative to the total. So we can see the complexity of this function here and how much simpler it is when, in fact, uh, these are uh, diffuse surfaces such that we don't have to worry about the directional variation. And finally, integrating the spectral reflectivity uh, times incident irradiation at any given wavelength and integrating over all wavelengths, we get the total hemispherical reflectivity. Some of the radiation that isn't reflected can be absorbed by a surface. And there we have the definition, or we now define the absorptivity, which is the fraction of that irradiation which is absorbed by the surface. We have the same definitions, except now we're talking about the quantity which is absorbed. So most complex, we have the spectral directional absorptivity, which is a function of wavelength and direction. And of course, it's that fraction which is absorbed at that given direction and wavelength relative to the total. If we look at all directions, or if it's a diffuse surface, so it's the same in all directions, and we integrate over the hemisphere, we have the spectral hemispherical absorptivity, which is that fraction of the irradiation which is absorbed at a given wavelength relative to the total irradiation at that wavelength. And finally, if we look at all wavelengths combined, we can look at the total hemispherical absorptivity, which is that fraction of the irradiation which is absorbed relative to the total. Again, we can have the more detailed definition, which is useful for thinking about our surface approximations later on, where we're multiplying the radiation intensity uh, that is incident uh, by that absorptivity at each wavelength and direction relative to the total. And similarly, integrating over uh, all wavelengths to get the total hemispherical absorptivity. Finally, that irradiation, some of it was reflected, some of it was absorbed, and if it's a transparent surface, some of it may be transmitted through that surface and carry through on the other side of that surface. And the transmissivity represents that fraction which is transmitted. Again, we have the same quantities, and now it's just the portion uh, which is transmitted. 
uh, of the incoming irradiation. So we have the spectral directional transmissivity, the spectral hemispherical transmissivity, and the total hemispherical transmissivity. Again, the definitions here, where we're multiplying the transmissivity inside our integral uh, in order to get our spectral hemispherical transmissivity and integrating over all wavelengths in order to get our total hemispherical transmissivity. Now we think of the energy balance on the surface. Of course, this is a straightforward energy balance. There is a certain amount of, radi of E radiation G coming in watts per meter squared. Some of it is reflected, some of it is absorbed, and some of it is transmitted. And so, of course, of that total uh, E radiation coming in, it can either be absorbed, uh, reflected, or transmitted. And if it's an opaque surface, that means the transmissivity is zero. So if it's an opaque surface, it can either be absorbed or reflected. And that gives us some relation between our properties here. Of course, the absorptivity plus the reflectivity plus the transmissivity has to be equal to one in order to conserve energy or for an opaque surface with the transmissivity equal to zero. The absorptivity plus the reflectivity is equal to one. Now, independent of the irradiation field that is incident upon a surface, any surface which is at a temperature above absolute zero is going to emit radiation. If it does it perfectly, it will emit it according to the, the Planck distribution uh, for black body radiation. However, a real surface won't emit as a black body, it will emit less than a black body. It will emit less than the ideal surface. And so we define the surface property, the emissivity, which is a number between 0 and 1, which reflects how much radiation is emitted compared to an ideal black body radiator. And so we know that a black body in, will emit sigma ts to the fourth, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and we multiply that by the emissivity in order to get the amount that's emitted from our real surface. And of course, we have all the same uh, definitions for our emissivity uh, that we had uh, for our other surface properties. We have the spectral directional emissivity, which of course is a function of the wavelength and the direction, and we know this is a function of temperature as well, Mer-Planck distribution, and that is the radiation intensity that is emitted uh, relative to that of a black body at the same uh, wavelength and temperature. If we integrate over uh, all wavelengths, we can talk about a total directional emissivity, but we're looking at that which is emitted in a given uh, direction relative to uh, the black body, which of course emits in all directions equally. And we can look at the spectral hemispherical emissivity, where we're looking now uh, integrated over all directions, or if it's a diffuse surface, constant in each direction, the uh, emission at a given wavelength relative to the black body emission at that same temperature and wavelength. And our total hemispherical emissivity, the amount that we're emitting at that given temperature compared to what a black body emits at that given temperature. And these are, of course, surface properties. So again, we can look at the, uh, the definitions uh, in more detail. And again, these are useful for thinking about uh, the surface assumptions that we'll make in our heat transfer course. So now, the total radiation that's leaving a surface is the combination of that which is emitted because it's at some finite temperature and that which is reflecting of the incident radiation. We combine those two together, the emitted radiation and the reflected radiation, and we give that the symbol J, and it's called the radiosity. And it's important to remember that the surface is emitting at perhaps probably a much lower temperature, often somewhere around room temperature. And then we have a spectrum that looks something like this, which could be very, very, very different than the irradiation. And the reflected radiation will, of course, have the spectrum of the irradiation, which can be wildly different, especially when we're talking about room temperature surfaces and perhaps a radiation coming from the sun. So of the irradiation coming in, some fraction is reflected, some fraction is absorbed. If it's not opaque, uh, then some fraction might be transmitted, and independently we have emission from that surface. Again, those two things together making up the radiosity J. And so the summary of our uh, radiative heat fluxes, we have the emissive power E, that's the rate that radiation is emitted per unit area, and of course it depends on the surface temperature. We have the E radiation G, that's the rate that radiation is incident on a surface per unit area, and that of course depends on the temperature of the surroundings or the temperature of the source of that radiation. The radiosity is just the combination of the emission from the surface and the amount that's reflected of that irradiation. So it's the rate that radiation leaves the surface per unit area. And of course, we have the net heat flux from a surface due to radiation, Q double prime rad uh, for radiation. And that's the net rate 
that radiation is leaving the surface per unit area, and so you have to look at the entire energy balance in order to get that net rate of heat transfer. And of course, we could have a situation where there's many different surfaces involved, and we have to look at the exchange between uh, each and every surface in order to get the total net rate from that surface. Yeah, moving on, I want to think about enclosures. And if we have an enclosure, uh, we'll assume that it's steady state, and we'll assume that the, the walls are opaque, so the absorptivity plus the reflectivity is equal to 1. And we have the surface of this enclosure at some temperature Ts. So, of course, there's going to be uh, emission uh, from that surface, and that emission will be our emissivity times our sigma Ts to the fourth. And at the same time, we're going to get uh, the, the, the radiation field that's in here. Some of it is going to be reflected by that surface, um, and it'll be reflected in, in terms of the reflectivity times the irradiation field that we have there. If this were a black body enclosure, then of course that is the perfect admitter and absorber. So it emits like a black body uh, by definition, and it's a perfect absorber. So the absorptivity is one and the reflectivity is zero. And so my irradiation field is of course going to be the radiation uh, having the characteristics of a black body at the surface temperature. Now let's think about a real surface. In the real surface, we have an emission which is less than that, and there is some reflections from the other surfaces in our enclosure. Now, it actually turns out that this is how we can make uh, something very, very close to black body radiation, because any radiation that is emitted in here is going to be reflected so many times that ultimately it will has to be absorbed somewhere in the enclosure. And if that's the case, then we expect that these combinations of reflections and emissions are going to add up and give us at the actual the, the inner radiation field that is that of a black body. And we'll see perhaps why this is in, in a moment, but it does work in reality that if I take an enclosure like this, this is how I create a black body cavity. If I make a small opening in this, because of all of those reflections, it's going to be diffuse because it's had many reflections off many directions, and the radiation that's going to be emitted is going to be diffuse. And it will have something very, very, very close to the Planck distribution, again, because of all of those reflections and absorptions, um, but let's see what it means if this, if this were to have any radiation field that was that of a black body. It means that my radiosity is, of course, that emission, emissivity, times the black body emission, plus the reflectivity times my irradiation. And my irradiation, I've already postulated and said that in reality it is a sigma Ts to the fourth. And so that uh, reflectivity is, of course, 1 minus the absorptivity from conservation of energy for an opaque surface. And so I get a radiosity that looks like this. If the emissivity is equal to the absorptivity, then I can replace this term with 1 minus epsilon. And I can see that, in fact, my radiosity is, as it should be, that black body radiation that I expect to see in this enclosure. And so we have an interesting clue here uh, that, in this case, the emissivity is going to be equal to the absorptivity. And of course, one way to think about this, that way, my radiosity is equal to my irradiation, uh, as I would expect it to be in that enclosure. And of course, one way to think about this is to think about equilibrium from these surfaces. If we know, in fact, equilibrium from these two enclosures, if I have a black body enclosure, which is in fact very close to what really happens, and I have this other enclosure where I have a finite emissivity and, and reflectivity and absorptivity, and I want these things to be in equilibrium, and of course they're both at a surface temperature Ts. If this distribution in one was different than the distribution in the other, and I put them in contact, there would be some kind of energy transfer between them. That would violate the definition of equilibrium. And so again, this is a strong suggestion that, in fact, we do get the black body radiation inside that enclosure because of all of those reflections and absorptions and, and, and multiple uh, interactions across those surfaces, and in fact, that the emissivity is equal to the absorptivity. Now, if we have a small object in an enclosure, that small object, in order to be in equilibrium, has to be taking in exactly as much energy as it's giving off. Otherwise, it would not be in equilibrium. And if it's a small object in this enclosure, of course, it's going to be at the same temperature as the enclosure itself. And that will tell us, if we look through that requirement for that surface to be in equilibrium, that the emissivity of the object is equal to the absorptivity for the object. If it weren't, it would not be in equilibrium. And since it is an enclosure, of course, the irradiation is that of a black body at Ts. So if we have any problems where we have a small object in a large enclosure, we can take that the irradiation field is, in fact, the black body radiation at the temperature of the enclosure Ts.
Now, what happens if we remove the enclosure? We could say that that, even in the absence of the enclosure, that the absorptivity is equal to the emissivity. And in fact, this is the assumption of a gray surface. It's a very useful for engineering calculations. It doesn't always hold true, uh, but when it does, it simplifies our calculations greatly. That The total hemispherical absorptivity is equal to the total hemispherical emissivity. We'll see lots of examples where that's not true, but let's look at this visualized. The Planck distribution is the blue line, giving us the total maximum amount of emissive power at any given wavelength. The real distribution may look like the orange line, where this is changing uh, quite dramatically. It may be even more dramatic than this, uh, very strongly with wavelength. And that would, of course, be a little bit more challenging us for it to deal with and even to communicate what this distribution actually looks like. If we can say that there's one single number that represents this, at that, for our gray surface, we're saying that this green line prevails and that that emissivity is a constant over this whole uh, distribution. And so that's what it looks like uh, spectrally. It's very useful in our radiation calculations to be able to assume that alpha is equal to epsilon, the total hemispherical properties. Now that's a fairly restrictive um, assumption, the gray surface. And more generally, as long as any surface or the irradiation is diffuse, we can say that the spectral absorptivity is equal to the uh, spectral emissivity. That is, the alpha at any given wavelength is equal to the emissivity at any given wavelength. And then we can uh, handle those variations and calculate what it is at each given wavelength. Saying that the spectral emissivity is equal to the spectral absorptivity is something that will be much more practical for many of our calculations. And the reason for that, of course, is that often the surface temperature is very different than the temperature of the surroundings. That is, the spectrum of the emitted radiation is very, very different than the spectrum of the irradiation field. And very often, we will find that we, the gray assumption is not valid when we actually calculate what these total hemispherical emissivities and absorptivities are with given examples, we find that they are not actually equal. However, they are equal for any diffuse surface as a function of lambda. And most complicated, but with the least number of restrictions at all, the directional spectral properties uh, will always be equal. Of course, this one is very handy for engineering calculations, very useful for us. Uh, this is much more realistic for many of our situations, and we'll use that quite a bit. Uh, but if you want it to get even more complicated, you can know that this will always be true.